Hey everyone, my name is Justin Woodring and this is Computing Science with Justin Woodring. Today I want to talk about Grover search algorithm. The Grover search algorithm is a algorithm in quantum computing that allows for a faster than linear search. Now, if all those terms sound fancy and stuff like that, um, that's because most of this is based in, you know, the mathematics that supports why these things even work in the first place. Uh, but we're going to dive into it, uh, walk through what a linear search is, if you weren't familiar with that. And although this will require a little bit of expertise in uh, quantum computing, it shouldn't be anything that you can't handle if you aren't, um, you know, at least regularly familiar with the basic quantum gates like um, control knots or CXs, gates, uh, anything like that. Uh, if you aren't familiar with those, I'll be coming out with some videos on those soon. Um, I also post about these kinds of things on my blog. So um, definitely, yeah, stay tuned if you um, if you aren't ready for this, and I'll have some content out soon. And otherwise, then let's just dive in and talk about uh, what Grover search algorithm is. Okay, so I want to go into like some of the I guess background of uh, Grover search first. So I've got that kind of information on the right here, um, and basically, let's first talk about a linear search. So base. If I asked you to, if I gave you, okay, let's first consider the number of um, bits that could be, or number, yeah, the number of bit strings that can be made with two bits. So that's going to basically be these right here. You get, um, you would have 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, and 1, 1. Now, I've put these out of order because um, a faster than linear searching can be faster for a structured search, but for an unstructured, which means your data isn't ordered and you don't know about the order that's going to be presented in or, and you can't make any reliable guesses about it. Um, so if I wanted to identify basically which one of these had a leading bit where it's one. So in other words, this bit right here is one, then I would have to look through this entire list. So I'm going to have to go, well, this one isn't, this one is, so I'm going to mark that one. This one is, I'm going to mark that one and this one isn't. So I'm not going to mark that one. Um, on average, if I was going to have to go through a list, I'd have to go halfway through the list. That's because sometimes everything you're looking for is at the very front, and sometimes everything you're looking for, or the one thing you're looking for, is at the very back. Um, so that's the general premise of a linear search. Um, it'd be the same as if you wrote down a list of names on a piece of paper in any random order and then said, you know, find Jim, you know, like assuming Jim's one of the names in that list. You're going to have to go probably about halfway down the list on average to find Jim. And sometimes he'll be at the very end and sometimes he's the first name on the list. It's that general concept. The reason I've presented it in this bit string uh, format here is because this is what we'll be dealing with when we demonstrate Grover's search algorithm. Um, Grover's search algorithm is obviously intended to be run on uh, bit strings or effectively indexes. Um, and more importantly, it's not a search in the traditional sense. Um, you can't say, well, you know, you need to have basically some information about what the bit string contains built in to the bit string itself uh, effectively, or at least associated with it. Um, that way you can make a strong correlation because Grover search algorithm isn't going to literally just like go through a list for you. It kind of has this thing that's called an oracle and we'll get more into that later, but I just want to say there's a reason that I'm using bit strings specifically. Um, and so what we have here is basically if we wanted to apply Grover search to this, then in the worst case, we would have to run two iterations of Grover search to get this. And that's because Grover search can basically search through this list faster than you could just by going one, two, three, four. It can search the list in the square root of the um, number of items in a list. So and that's the worst case scenario. Um, which means that it could potentially return results in less than that, but you'll most likely have to run it at least, you know, or not most likely, but you'll sometimes have to run it this many times. Um, thing is that this is an exponential difference. So what that means is that for, um, large, um, for large numbers, basically, you're going to get a drastic trade-off very quickly. Um, so let's say that you're searching 64 names on the list. There's 64 names, you're gonna to have to go through 32 of them on average. In worst case scenario, you have to go through 64 of them. But Grover Search only has to go eight iterations. Um, and bear in mind what I'm saying here by saying iterations versus going through them is because a linear search, each iteration would be going through one item. But in Grover Search, you're 
kind of going through all of them at the same time. And each time you iterate Grover's search algorithm, it's effectively increasing the probability of finding the correct answers. Um, and that is based on quantum amplitudes and the idea of basically using interference and um, yeah, interference and coherence to effectively cancel out the results you don't want and amplify the values of the results you do want. Now that's a very physics-y explanation of that. Um, and honestly, math-based explanation as well. So we won't dive too much into that because we're more or less looking for this kind of like intuitive understanding we can really build about this. But that's the general premise behind why we're dealing with like these, you know, amplifying in the first place, um, dealing with probabilities. So now that we've looked at this and have a general idea of what the difference between a linear search and something that's faster than linear search is, um, let's go ahead and basically try to design a Grover search uh, gate by gate. And so I will first want to mention that there's three major, um, there's three major components of any basically Grover search. And that is you've got an oracle, you've got the initial superposition, and then you have a diffusion operator. Now the oracle is very interesting, and I, I mentioned that earlier, because it effectively represents a predicate. Um, Grover search can almost be thought of as like, rather than searching, it's filtering. Um, and so you're going to return the, with high probability, the result that effectively match the filter. Um, and so that's probably a better way, in my opinion, of thinking about it. Um, but, you know, people have different terms for these things. So an Oracle could technically embody a database. And if it knows something about this database, then it could be used to search the database. But the thing is that building a database into an Oracle might be more work than actually just searching it through linear means. And so there's all, there's, there is some still trade-offs. Grover search isn't a complete replacement for any linear search. Um, and it's more or less a theoretical algorithm in certain cases, but the better way of thinking about it is that the Oracle, like I said, is a predicate or a filter. And so you can, if you can find a bit string, like it's easier to solve math equations with it. Um, if you basically find a bit string and you're like, hey, I want I want all the answers that satisfy this mathematical problem and give me a, a specific answer for this mathematical problem, Grover search algorithm is really good at that. But in a more traditional sense, if you're looking for names on a list, um, you know, like I want to find Jim. I mean, you know, you could just encode Jim's binary encoding into the thing and say, can it match Jim? But uh, it's not as suitable for like the traditional searching that someone might do. Um, so that being said, like so we're gonna go focus on building this thing right here. Um, so let's get started. So I want to, I'm gonna do exactly what we did right here um, with this search iterations for. So I wanna mark, basically I wanna find, I wanna search this problem space and I wanna mark these bit strings. So first thing we wanna do is we wanna make sure I like to do this with three qubits. Um, I consider one to be an ancillary an ancillary qubit. Um, and what that means is basically that I'm not going to measure the result of that one, but it's easier for me to basically work with it if I do it that way. So I like doing it that way, but you don't have to. Um, it can be done with just two qubits, but you know, again, that's kind of preference. Um, it can go either way. So let's go ahead and grab our, first we wanna put it into initial superposition. That's the absolute first thing we're gonna do. We just do that right here. Now. I made a, a blog post actually about this the other day. And it's this concept of phase kickback. Um, and if you aren't familiar with control gates, then they probably would be easier to understand than if you are familiar with control gates, honestly. Um, so the premise is that usually a control gate is controlled by something that's like basically operated like a dot like this. And this specifically has to do with gates that affect the phase. So there would be a poly Z gate. Um, is, for example, one gate that affects phase. The S gate is um, also going to affect phase, and this one can affect phase as well, the P gate. These are all partial or complete, like half turns, quarter turns, or eight turns in phase. Um, and if you look at the block sphere, that means it's basically going to rotate around this way, like, you know, it's going around, not up and down. Um, so, given it as such, like I was talk saying, um, basically a control gate traditionally relies on the value of this to alter this. So it's going to check this and then it's going to alter this effectively is what it does. But 
in this case, when you use a Z gate, and particularly when the gate you're attempting to control is in some kind of superposition, um, any value other than zero actually, it's going to alter the gate at the top, or it's going to alter the uh, cube at the top, I'm sorry. So, like I was saying, if you normally, this thing should measure here, and it should, or not measure, but it should basically base its effect on this qubit by observing-ish this qubit. I don't want to use the word observe because that's kind of not what it's doing in physics sense because they're like, oh, observe, collapse, superposition. Well, it's not going to collapse your superposition, but it does, there's a correlation between what happens here and it will be output here, basically. It's a better way to put it traditionally. But when we use a, uh, when we are using phase kickback, it's this interesting thing where the controls are actually affected and the um and the and so, or yeah and the gate that has the target is what it would usually be called it, or the qubit that has the target is going to be um that one's going to not really experience much of a change or it's going to only experience like maybe half of a change um and that mostly depends on the state that this thing's in so like if it's a full one it's not going to experience any phase change if it's a if it's in this 50 state, it'll experience some of the phase change, and this one will experience some of the phase change. So what we're going to use this for, this is effectively, we're going to use this for a marking mechanism. And you can read more about this because um, they have some stuff about this on Wikipedia and stuff like that. But effectively, what we're doing is we're tagging the value we want. And so if we thought of this here as like our, um, thought of this as like our, oh, this would be our first one, like our first bit is a second bit. We're going to tag this one, but say we want this one to be on all the time, you know? So we want all the results where this one is on, basically. So now that we've accomplished that, um, we're going to, so this is our very, very simple oracle. Basically just gonna tag the one on this specific qubit. And we don't really care about what this value takes here. So what is the saying? Give us the one and the other one can be a zero or one. I don't care, it doesn't matter. Um, so after that, we're going to apply the diffusion operator. Um, so now that we've been, this is literally our, this is our oracle. This one thing is our oracle. Everything that comes after it is our diffusion operator. Now the diffusion operator, an iteration of Grover's algorithm would be two applications of, or not two applications, but it would be an application of the phase oracle followed by the diffusion operator, followed by the phase oracle, followed by the, um, basically, yeah, the combination of the phase oracle and then the diffusion operator counts as one iteration. So like I said, we're going to build that um diffusion operator now and the thing is that the diffusion operator is generic which basically means that it's a one size or it's the design of it fits every single kind of predicate you could care about because um because the only thing you need to change is actually the um oracle itself the phase operator if you have three three qubits it's going to look the same as if you have like three qubits for a different problem. Um, if you have changed the number of qubits, it'll look a little bit different, but all in all, it's relatively similar either way. So what I'm going to do here is I'm just gonna start putting on these Hanamards. Um, and it actually, if you look at these probabilities here, you can kind of see as I alter these states, what's being done. So like even right off the bat, if I remove these real quick, you can see that I've already basically kind of altered this one from its traditional state that this one was in and tagged it a bit. So it's it's off now. Anyway, Add the Hadamard to all of these again. You can see that now this one is off completely, but this one's still on. So it's kind of like, oh, I, you know, it looks a little bit different. So it's been marked effectively, and you're going to start to see that propagate. Um, so the next step is to apply these X gates. And then this, the, there's a few more things we're going to do here, which is basically where we apply this, like, we're re hadamarding this, and the reason why is because, like I said, sometimes the, the ancillary qubit is actually used in the output. I don't like to do it that way because I find it annoying to do it that way. Um, it doesn't really matter if you do, though. It's just you may have to um, design your oracle a little bit differently. Um, so now the next part is this multi-controlled qubit. So this, again, this is the fusion operator, and it looks the same for every single one of these circuits. It just kind of is. Um, and what it's accomplishing geometrically is, or mathematically, is a basically a reflection about the change you made. So like I said, each iteration is amplifying the probabilities. Um, 
So you are effectively, the diffusion operator is going to take the markings that your oracle provided and it's going to amplify the probability of getting the markings that, or getting the results with that were marked and decrease the probability of getting the uh, probabilities that you did not mark. Or, yeah, answers basically that you did not mark. Um, so I'm going to proceed to apply our X gates here. And then finally, the last thing we're going to do is um, basically re add our all these things. So if you look at the end here, we would apply if we want we, if we wanted to we could apply another iteration of all of this stuff here but like i said this is the phase oracle and then this here is your um this here is going to be your diffusion operator so at this point we can see that basically the value we selected is on the rest of it is a 50 50 percent chance of being measured and that's what we wanted because we basically want this to be oh well give me an on here and we want this one to be one or zero and we don't care and so it did what it's supposed to do and we can see that by literally building it by hand um there's also the, some other tools you can use to help that may help visualize this as well um but i really like quirk um there is the ibms uh, they have the composer which lets basically do similar things um so we're gonna switch over to ibms real quick and just look at the composer. So for example, the composer, one thing I do like about it is this little thing in the corner. So it'll tell you the probabilities of measuring. I already actually have built the Hadamard gate here. So it's basically doing the same thing. And as you can see, um, in this case, I've basically, I think I might've selected these backwards, but the point bears the same that one of these is going to be zero or one, one. That's it. That's the only one you're getting. So um, I'd have to look at my notes to make sure I did right. Yeah. So we want these to actually we, we selected the right side, not the left side. So if I wanted to change this, I would actually edit this right here. Change this to one. Okay. So we fixed our logic. Um, and actually that means my, um, my work thing here is a little broken as well. And I can change this. So um, this has to do with like the Indian encoding of your uh, specific qubit circuit. So this is really going to boil down more to how your bit strings are read out. It can go either way. Sometimes it's right to left, sometimes it's left to right. Um, I believe that IBM and Quirk agree on this, but I get them backwards sometimes. It just depends on what tool, basically tool you're using. Um, the vendor's difference would differ. So like if you're using something like, you know, like uh, penny lane and like bracket on a specific machine, you might see different results. And that's just, you know, that's just the way, you know, the vendors chose to make it. So if you do get your, bit strings backwards, that's why. Um, but as um, as I stated, we've basically accomplished the same, I accomplished the same circuit at some point in the past, uh, right before this video actually, and um, we can measure, we've measured the states we want. So this has been marked, and this is after actually one iteration, it returns the correct results. Bear in mind it's a simulator, but still. Um, so what I want to do now is actually walk through building this um, in Qiskit code, uh, because you know, coding's fun, right? So that's what we're gonna do next. Uh, I'm just gonna pop this pane open here. And it's funny, they actually have this uh, this little grow research thing. This thing's actually pretty cool. We should check it out at some point. It's gonna look a little different from ours because ours is a bit more basic version of Grover's. Um, and it's, I'd say it's a bit more hard coded for the purposes of basically demonstrating the algorithm itself. Um, but we're just gonna open up a new notebook here. And again, if you watched my last video with the composer, um, then it's going to be a pretty similar run through. Um, so I'm just gonna go ahead and get started. Just gonna make sure to get my ancillary qubits. I'm not gonna actually execute it this time, at least not, um, I'm not gonna execute it on their platform because I don't really feel like burning minutes for no reason, but you know, you can if you want, you know, I'm just not going to myself. Um, obviously, I actually demonstrated doing that in the last video. So if you want to do that, that's certainly something you can do pretty easily. Um, yeah, so we're just going to go ahead and, oh, I'm going to try to copy and paste something here. But this is actually from my last video. Oh, but it refuses to copy and paste. So um, if I do, oh, there we go. So that's perfect. 
Um, I want to actually, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a register. One more right here. So, um, and the reason I'm doing ANC is just because it's easier to, for me to think about logically when I'm applying some of these gates and stuff like that, especially when I want to measure out. So, um, the next thing we're going to do is just keep, keep, oh, put that down at the bottom there again. So, at this point, we won't really have any, we shouldn't really have anything to look at, so we're just going to get started actually making the um, circuit itself. And in order to do that, all we have to do is just go ahead and start, like, basically writing this, the, the um, superposition and stuff like that. So, we're just going to do going to do QC Hadamard operation on R and then we're so actually I'm going to label this section first we're going to call this init super position QC dot A R QC QC perfect okay and then we're going to Move down to the next section. And again, we found out that we really should only need one iteration in order for it to return good, good enough results, even though technically, on worst case, we'd need two. But this seems to work fine anyway. So um, we're going to do, for this one, we're going to do uh, a phase order. And so this is where you're basically going to select your first qubit and then map it to the, you want to make sure in this language c so basically the first parameter of this arg or this function is going to be the control and the second one is going to be the um it's gonna be a target and actually we want to make this a cd remember we're doing a phase uh kickback here so this is a controlled z gate um so we're just going to go you are and we want to set this to i believe it is the one gate that we want to actually uh, lock down and then um we make our target gate the A and C. So that's our phase oracle. Super simple. Um, and the last part is going to be a little bit longer, I will say. Um, but you know, it's not the end of the world. It just bear in mind again. This thing, the second part is a um, is a generic diffusion operator. So it doesn't really oh, answer. Uh, it doesn't really change the way it looks regardless of what your oracle looks like. So we're just going to do uh, a QC dot H on your and bear in mind you if like you know you design your circuit especially for small circuits like if you if you design your circuit in something like work or even the composer um, you can you know reference it when you're writing it out here um, so X Y And then our QC dot MCT or MCT is interesting because um, you could technically use a CCX gate as well in this particular scenario, but MCT is a multi control, which basically means any number of controlled um, qubits. It's a controlled X gate still. It's just, it's not, a, it's not limited to like a certain number of parameters like CCX or um, something like that. So, um, I think, here, let's make sure I, this is actually, did this earlier, and yeah, I was saying, yeah, so you can just, you have half the entire QR in there, and then, like, like that. And finally, we're going to, um, just perform our, QC dot X on R and QC dot H on QR and QC dot H. So that should accomplish our circuit, um, like our basically our quantum circuit representation that we just designed in the composer. Well, work, and then I showed you in the composer as well. So we should be able to add our measurements at this point. And that would basically be the end of it. So we're going to 
Um, it's gonna, and this is the, one of the reasons I like using ancillary qubits for this is because so now that we've done our diffusion operator, we're gonna oh, again, move it down here. We're gonna do QC, uh, and I can just map QC straight out to the uh, or QR straight out to the CR, which is the classical register. Um, and finally, you know, that after that's done, you can do a QC dot draw. Well, I'll actually do this in a separate part. So that's gonna be our measurement operation. And I can never click the right button, but um, C dot draw. I like to do the MATLAB output. It looks better in my opinion. And then we will actually uh, go ahead and uh, simulate it. So I'm going to copy these simulator code here. Um, and then um, we're going to go ahead and run this thing. So I don't know if we even need these here. So I'm just going to comment them out for now. So I don't feel like loading them if it's not necessary. And run, run. Oh, it doesn't like that. Uh, the, oh, I forgot to import some of the, uh, I forgot to import the normal kiss kit stuff as well. So I'm just gonna drop these in here. So you got plot histogram. That's important for looking at the um, visual output. You need the classical um, registers and quantum circuits. So quantum circuits actually already here, but we'll just import these on top of it. It should be fine. Um, and actually plot histogram was already included as well. So I think the only one we're missing was actually the quantum and classical registers. And three positional arguments, but I definitely typed something wrong with that. Yeah. Oh, I actually meant to just build a QC gate here, not. I wanted to make a quantum. I don't know why I did something wrong there. <laughs> okay, so um, move here, click that, perfect. This thing doesn't like me because a, a qubit doesn't exist, even though it does. You are A and C C R oh. that that's what we want. Perfect. Now we do that. Now it'll work. So yes, make sure your string looks like this. I think I accidentally typed the measure operation as opposed to creating a new quantum circuit, but and other than that, we're fine. That's our phase oracle. Fusion operator, measurement operation, draw it. That looks like what we prototyped. So it should do what we want to do. Um and then we just run it. As you can see, we don't have the other values showing up at all. So this demonstrates that we did correctly select our values. Um, so there you have it. That's uh, basically a walkthrough of implementing Grover search algorithm, both in the gate, um, like a you know circuit, like uh, work type, like simulator, and then actually programming it yourself. So there you have it. Um, yeah, stay tuned for more content if you like this. Uh, I'm gonna be making videos about the gate. And, you know, again, congratulations for uh, pursuing your journey in quantum computing.